good morning. I'm Wanda Curley and I'm one of the Autism Resource Specialists for the Autism Society of North Carolina in Greensboro. And I'm um, happy to welcome you to Practical Considerations for Parents and Caregivers, Navigating End of Life Planning, um, which we um, will be together for about an hour and a half to two hours discussing some practical considerations for parents and caregivers. I just want to say that I applaud you for joining me. This topic this morning can be a really um, what I call a heavy topic for us as parents and caregivers as we're talking about um, navigating end of life planning for our loved ones with autism or other disabilities. So thank you for joining me. Um, I also want to put just a little disclaimer on it that um, I am a parent of a 28 year old uh, young adult male with autism. I'm not a legal expert in any way or uh, a certified financial planner. So um, what I'm doing this morning is just sharing some practical considerations with you. And in a lot of cases, we'll be directing you to resources where you can get more information um, and maybe possibly legal assistance with some of these um, considerations for end of life planning. Outline to share with you just so you kind of know our plan for today. Um, our introduction, you know, why do we need to plan for the future? What are some of the barriers? What are some of the benefits? And, and then probably importantly, where do I start? I'm going to talk briefly about some government benefits, state and federally funded programs that can help with end of life planning and um, guardianship and alternatives. Um, that's kind of a topic that we could talk about for uh, a while in itself, so I'll um, hit on the um, important points of that and then send you to some other resources. Um, we'll talk about ABLE accounts, which are a fairly new tool over the past few years here in North Carolina and across the country. Um, we'll talk about finding a qualified professional to help you plan if you uh, need assistance, which in some cases you might um, for funding some of these practical considerations and plans. We'll talk about putting your vision on paper and drafting what's known as a letter of intent. That might be a new um, uh, uh, title for you. Uh, we'll talk about special needs trust, which can be very complicated, but I'll give you some um, you know, basics about that. We'll talk about other considerations as you're planning, um, enrichment programs, college and employment and residential options for your loved one, what might be available, um, then we'll talk about how do you prepare your child support team, those people who might step into a caregiver role when you are no longer around. And then, too, we'll talk about maybe one of the hardest things is, you know, how would I prepare my child? Should I prepare my child? And that's going to be very individualized for each one of us who's on this webinar. So we'll get started and I'll just say right up front that um, most of us spend lots of time planning for the future, whether it's within the framework of our individual goals or family needs or our vaca uh, vocations. Um, and then especially during 2020, things have taken quite a turn with the pandemic and um, things going on um, in this fast paced world. Most families are still trying to plan ahead for various goals. Um, you know, whether it's buying a home or sending a child to college or saving for retirement. So you may wonder what's the big difference in a typical family's planning and future planning for a family of a child who has a disability or special needs. So we know that families who have children with autism or other disabilities may face additional challenges as they plan because in most cases, we are planning for two generations. I think most of us would agree that our loved one with a disability may require at least our financial assistance in some way or form or other support across their lifetime. So you would frequently hear from us as autism resource specialists, when you have met one person with autism, you have met one person with autism. That's something that we say frequently. So I'll just say right up front that future planning for each of us on this webinar will look very different. Some of you may need to plan very intricately in, in a very detailed manner for lots of support, while others may not need near as much consideration or planning. Uh, some of you will be able to plan alongside your loved one with autism. And this is certainly a preferred scenario, if at all possible. You probably hear me say that several times, um, but if they can join in the planning with you, all 
Um, still, some of our loved ones will not be able to voice their input, so your planning may need to be more detailed and thorough. So what are some of the barriers to future planning? Well, first, there are definitely emotional factors. You know, dealing with the present for a lot of us, especially during 2020, is already hard enough, and it's often hard to see what the future may hold. And even if we can see ahead to a degree, sometimes we're just fearful or we're overwhelmed, so we do nothing. And one of the first and most important takeaways from this webinar that I hope you'll see is that things are going to change frequently, so we can't expect to have all the answers at once. Remember, it's important to address your own personal needs first, and your child depends on you now as well. Sometimes when we start talking about this topic with families, um, it can just get really heavy really fast. And I, I quickly like to say, you know, we have to start where we are in the moment. And we have daily, daily, you know, today, day to day obligations. So do what you can when you can and where you can. Your child's depending on, on you right now as well. Um, one of the other biggest barriers that I hear about when I'm talking to families is just um, the discussion of these issues with family. Sometimes it's the big elephant in the room. You know, let's face it, no one particularly enjoys talking about death or about the possibility that we will have to one day leave our loved ones behind. And just having that conversation, opening up with family members about these matters can be difficult. And especially when it involves who's going to be the caregiver or successive caregiver or support person, to a loved one who we know is probably going to be navigating those challenges on through their adulthood. So most typical families, you know, to adulthood and then they expect that child to live independently for the most part. And if you're on this webinar with me right now, you probably are not seeing that as your reality. I know that's not mine. Um, so I do want to give a tip right up front. Um, find families in similar situations and gain support. Um, this really is a bonus as you may not just get support for yourself, but you may be beginning to build a network for your child's future. Um, you know, I have families who say, you know, I really don't have a lot of extended family here in North Carolina with me, but there's a the really nice uh, autism community here in North Carolina. And I think people who really want to get involved and want to support each other. So um, this is just a plug too. If you've not already connected to your um, ASNIC parent chapter or some other type of support group, please see your autism resource specialist to get involved with your closest group. And I'll have a link later that will, if you don't know who your autism resource specialist is for your county here in North Carolina, every county has access to an autism resource specialist. We'll make sure that you have that. And, you know, just sharing your concerns and learning from others and their situations is going to provide some invaluable empowerment to you in starting this process. Another barrier that we hear about really often when we start talking about end of life planning is probably the most obvious one, and that is barrier. Uh, expenses may already be high in your household, you know, therapy co-payments, and here we are again in the middle of a pandemic and things are changing. Um, so lots of unknowns and uncertainties. So you may feel like you just really don't have a lot of extra financial resources to spare. And if there's any good news, which finally I hope to share some good news is that you don't necessarily need a lot of money upfront to start planning or to fund your plan. So if that's the case, what tools can help us? Well, we know that there are government benefits that your child may already receive or might receive later as an adult. Um, those can be supplementary. Um, there are life insurance policies that you already may own that can help. And much of the funding can actually come from your estate when you are gone. Assets including property or retirement funds or those types of things. And then we're also going to talk today about some savings accounts and some savings tools such as an ABLE account that may help you with some tax advantages. There are also some legal factors that we want to consider whenever we're doing future planning. No one wants to make a detailed plan and then have it not be able to be enacted when the time comes. So you may need an attorney or certified planner to help you. 
but again, there are resources to help you if even paying for their assistance would be a hardship at this time. Um, some planners or attorneys are able to offer services pro bono or at a very low cost to families. And again, that can be one of those things you can see your autism resource specialist <clears throat> for assistance or consult the list of resources. Actually, I have quite a few slides at the end of the presentation that will give you some ideas of um, where to contact um, some of these legal resources that may be able to help at a lower cost. So you can make a plan and you can have it set to be funded without spending all of your current savings. Um, some of the minimal planning tools required that we will look at some of these um, in depth would include things such as your will, your letter of intent, your durable power of attorney, a healthcare proxy, and a special needs trust. And some of these you may already actually have. Um, some of these you, especially like a will, families sometimes will write um, up a will before knowing that they have a child with special needs, and then you may need to make some changes and, you know, fund a trust with that or whatever. So um, everyone's needs are different and no two plans are going to look exactly alike. So we've discussed some of the barriers to future planning and how it can be difficult. But in the long run, I hope you can see that the benefits really are great. Um, many families of individuals with autism or other disabilities express that common concern of what's gonna happen to my child when I'm no longer around. You know, I'm their, their best advocate, so what will happen? Um, well, hopefully getting a start on special needs planning and end of life planning can help ease your mind by ensuring that the provisions that are in place are carefully planned by you who already know and love your individual or your family member with a disability the most. They can help ensure that siblings and other key players of support are educated regarding the individual's eventual needs and that they are not left to get prepared or to make tough decisions during already difficult times. And then also um, planning ahead can ensure that the well-being of our loved one will stay secure and that their typical routines and lifestyles will be interrupted as little as possible when you are no longer around. Um, and I think that's one of the things I probably don't have to say, but most of us know that the typical routines and structure is so important to our loved ones with autism. And so, you know, being able to keep their life um, as much as running as smoothly as possible will be very important to us and to them. So in a nutshell, Future planning helps ensure your child's best life possible. So um, before we start talking about a lot of practical tools and consideration, these are some of the areas that we might look at when we're starting to make a vision of what does that best life look like? These are things that you wanna start thinking about if you haven't already. Um, what are the relationships and the friendships and the family that are important to your loved one, both now and, and, and down the line? Um, what 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 is their home like right now? What might it look like in the future? Um, health and wellness and safety and security. What does that look like for them? And what might it look like down the line? Their financial security, which we're gonna talk about, you know, more practical considerations for that. Um, their education or employment. You know, if your child's younger, um, you know, what do you think um, might be the future as far as are they gonna go to college? Are they going to be able to hold a job or a part-time job? We don't know those things yet, but just thinking ahead. And then I think one of the things that sometimes we neglect to really put into any kind of a vision that we write down is what are the things that really um, uh, give our loved one meaning and community involvement? You know, what do they do during their leisure time, their recreation? They're are they volunteers? Do they um, you know, enjoy a part in a faith community? community? These are things that are important and you know, probably need to be written down so that any future support persons would know, you know what's really important in their lives. And then we need to probably talk about self-determination. What are the choices that you know, our loved ones can make? We want them to have that determination as much as is possible. And then to support with decision-making and self-advocacy, which is so important to our loved ones. So we start to make a vision when we look at our child's life like it is um, right now in each of these areas, 
And then we try to kind of anticipate as best we can. Remember things are changing, but um, we wanna look at what might be needed in the future and then what supports um, would be needed to make those things a reality. So as I mentioned earlier, I really wanna stress that it's so important if you can include your loved one in this planning at all possible, you know, please include them to whatever extent they can be involved. Um, it's really important, I think, to encourage all individuals, regardless of their diagnosis or their disability, to have their dreams and to share those dreams and to live out those dreams and to be able to live as independently as possible. I think most of us agree that people who have that self-determination and, and choice in their lives um, are ultimately happier and more self-fulfilled self and purposeful. So we want to give them an opportunity where we can. So I think before moving on, um, most of us would agree that just knowing that we've done all we can do to ensure that our child will be living his or her best life will be priceless to us as we get older. Um, I think that's a very, very priceless gift we can give to ourselves as well as to them. So now, before we move on, um, you know, we're, we've discussed why future planning is important. And so let's talk about where to start. Um, in my mind, there are really three goals that we wanna start with in our planning. First, we wanna envision, we wanna begin to make a plan, some of those categories I mentioned on the previous pages, and then thinking about who's gonna be our child's support team, especially, you know, if we were to disappear tomorrow, you know, who would step in to really um, be their champion and their advocate and help them if they needed it. Where would he or she live? What supports are needed? And then once we even have that vision, and maybe you, you know, already do in your mind, but then it's very important to communicate and to share that plan with key support people, um, to make sure you have documents in a safe but easily accessible place and make sure that there are people who know where those are. And then we're gonna spend a lot more time today um, towards the end of our training now on making those practical considerations. You know, what can we do as far as financial planning, government benefits, guardianship and alternatives, mentioned already the ABLE accounts, wills and trusts, and even residential and vocational options. So once we're starting to envision that plan that we have, what are some of those practical considerations to consider? Well, let's start with government benefits, as many of us will not feel like we are going to have the endless funding to provide for every future need that some of our loved ones might have. And I'll tell you, I'm sharing here at the bottom of the screen um, a link to an article that's from the Journal of American um, Pediatrics from 2013. So it may actually be a little bit underestimated, but studies have estimated that the lifetime cost of supporting an individual with autism spectrum disorder can be as high as 2.4 million. Like I said, that was from 2013, could be higher now. Um, but we do know that, um, you know, some of our individuals on the spectrum are going to hold a full-time job. They may not require a lot of financial assistance outside their vocation. However, I think it's safe to say that many individuals on the spectrum are going to require some form of financial support um, because sadly to say many of our individuals are underpaid in their vocations um, and still others um, will not be able to hold a part-time job or a full-time job and would continue to need support after their school days are over. So there is state and federal programming available to assist individuals and families with supports. And many families of individuals with autism will be able to count on some type of outside assistance, depending on their needs and the level of severity of their autism. But as many of you probably already know, if you've looked into any type of government benefits or our state's um, uh, Medicaid programs, um, you know wait lists are long and they can be long and they are long here in North Carolina. So it's important to seek information as early as possible. So let's take a brief look at some of the government benefits that are or might eventually be available to your loved one on the spectrum as they age. And the first thing that I really wanna say up front and that we as autism resource specialists share with families 
who come to us with a new diagnosis, if you have not already connected with what's known as your managed care organization, um, here in North Carolina, we do not have mandated services for individuals with disabilities outside of the federal IDA that the school system provides, but we do have some um, uh, programs that are available for individuals who are eligible um, through our state. And um, the first thing would be to connect with your managed care organization. You can go into the link that I provided and put your county in and find out who that is. And you can find out about what's known as our innovations waiver services. I have a feeling some of you are probably already familiar with that. Um, but if you have not put your child on the registry of unmet need, um, that's one of those that uh, programs that I said does have a long wait list, but can provide some valuable supports. Um, if your child is already on that registry of unmet need or the wait list, um, make sure that you're checking in periodically to determine the status of where they are. And while they're on that wait list or registry of unmet needs, they may be able to qualify for B3 waiver services, including respite or developmental therapies. So we also suggest that you check in with your MCO as anything changes and your child would need additional or immediate supports. Um, and actually I could talk so much about accessing services. That's a kind of a topic in its own. So I'm gonna send you to another link here for more information. If you've not connected um, with your MCO at all before or found out a bit information about um, informa uh, innovations waiver services, please do check out this link, this whole page um, at the bottom of the slide, the accessing services page and we have lots of resources to help you get started with that. So um, I'll go on from there, but do check that out if you are uh, new to getting services through our state and federal funded programs. Supple some supplemental security income or SSI benefits, um, another government benefit that may be available to individuals with a documented disability. Um, here in North Carolina, individuals who receive SSI are automatically eligible to receive Medicaid health insurance, and that's not to be confused with the Medicaid waiver services that I mentioned on the previ previous slide. Um, individuals who receive SSI do not need to apply separately for Medicaid. Um, two key things to remember with SSI depend on the age of your child. With SSI under age 18, the child has to have a documented disability and the family must also meet stringent income and asset guidelines. Now, what happens um, when an individual is 18 and they're considered an adult, then the income and the resources of the family are not considered and just the income and resources of the individual um, are considered. So sometimes that's a game changer as our uh, children are growing up and become adults. They um, actually may not have received SSI as a child, but are able to get it as adults. So just a little bit about the definition of disability according to the SSI guidelines. For children, their disability must result in the inability to perform substantial gainful activity. And the Social Security Administration looks at six areas of functioning. They look at acquiring and using information, attending and completing tasks, um, interacting and relating with others, moving about and manipulating objects, caring for self, maintaining health and physical well-being. And the child must show marked limitations in two of these areas or extreme limitations in one domain to be considered potentially eligible to receive SSI. So for adults, the requirements are similar. Um, one thing to note here is that not all adults with a diagnosis of autism will qualify as having a disability for SSI purposes. Uh, the eligibility for adults will depend on the degree to which their autism affects their daily living, the ability to care for themselves, and their ability to hold a job. So we know that some individuals who qualify for SSI may work as long as they carefully follow certain guidelines regarding their income and assets. And some of the tools that we're going to discuss in just a minute will 
help greatly with financial resources for an individual, especially an adult individual who works and receives SSI. So as far as eligibility, the income and asset eligibility requirements can be found at this link. Um, and um, I will have an opportunity for you to get a copy if you're uh, trying to copy links down as we're going through. I just wanted to put your mind at ease on that. Um, if you uh, are moving along, I'll make sure that you're going to be able to get those at the end of the presentation. Um, also, just keep in mind to receive SSI that individuals may not have more than $2,000 assets in their name or they may lose eligibility. And if you have questions about that, again, what assets are counted, you may go to that link that's on this slide. Um, this slide contains links to information where you can find out more about the income requirements and what assets are considered as income in terms of SSI. You can also consult your local Social Security office or go in person to get information on the requirements for a child or adult. Um, and then we have the Child Disability Starter Kit. There's also one for adults and a disability report that helps you to start the process online. So here's a little bit more information on the application process for SSI. The first step, of course, is to complete the application. Adult applicants may complete the application online, but a child's application must be completed in person at your local Social Security office or over the telephone. You also want to keep in mind that most SSI claims will typically take about three to five months to be reviewed, so it's not an immediate process. The other thing that you want to keep in mind, if, if you are denied the first time, especially you, you may file an appeal within 60 days of receiving that denial notice. Uh, you may need to provide additional documentation about how your child's autism affects their daily living and functional activities such as self-care, communication, school, community outings, and etc. And you know, just keep in mind that many applications do get denied the first time. And you know, we encourage individuals and their families to take advantage of that appeal process, as many applications will eventually go through even if they were denied the first time. So it's often a matter of having to provide that additional documentation, the evaluations, or the recommendations from your child's providers. And again, for more information on SSI, you're welcome to contact your local autism resource specialist, or again, see the ASNIC Accessing Services Toolkit that I linked in that earlier slide, and we'll make sure that you have access to that at the end of the presentation. So another important consideration when making future plans is whether you might need to consider guardianship or its alternatives. And again, this is one of those topics that I could talk about um, for probably an hour or two on its own, but I do want to give you some key takeaways here. Um, one of those is that all individuals are presumed to be competent adults at age 18 by law. So a lot of times parents of children with disabilities will just assume that they will always have the authority to make decisions on their child's behalf, especially if that child does not have the intellectual ability to understand their rights. Parents may wonder if they even need to really even worry about guardianship if their child is obviously never going to be making decisions on their own. But we need to keep in mind that once our child reaches the age of majority, they are considered a legal adult for all intensive purposes. So there are some potential financial and legal ramifications once your child comes of legal age. For example, if your child signs a contract, even if he or she doesn't understand that contract, the contract is still binding if they are you know, considered an adult and they are their own guardian. Um, Another good example is with the healthcare system. Um, once your child is age 18, the HIPAA laws may prevent a medical care provider from talking to you about your child's uh, medical issues unless you are the guardian or unless you have permission from your child. So 
We know that guardianship and other legal arrangements or agreements can be extraordinarily helpful as your child begins to interact with the real world as an adult. Um, but we do want to make, you, make sure you're aware of some very important facts about guardianship and the alternatives. Um, declaring someone as legally incompetent is not a decision to be taken lightly. And advocates will typically stress to parents that the principle of least restriction needed is uh, always best. So again, the key points here are that at the age of 18, the child is legally considered an adult. The parents are no longer the legal guardian once that child, once that child reaches the age of majority. Um, and some adult children will need the protection of a guardian if they cannot care for themselves or communicate or make important decisions in their own best interest or manage their financial assets. But guardianship should never be automatic. Not all individuals with autism spectrum disorder will require the protection of a guardian. Um, and basically what we're looking at is considering the strengths, weaknesses, needs, and best interest of that individual before making a decision to seek guardianship. Many individuals with autism do not need the protection of the full guardianship, as I said. So some of the lesser alternatives to consider, and all of this information is gonna be included in the links that you see on these slides, but just to give you an idea of what we might be looking at, um, some of those alternatives would be limited guardianship, using power of attorney, a representative pay, payee for SSI, or a newer alternative, which you may or may not have heard of, called supported decision-making. Um, with these lesser alternatives, some individuals who are able to function at least semi-independently would get the needed support that they need, yet they would not lose their legal rights unnecessarily. So guardianship and alternatives is a topic, like I said, we could discuss it for a while. So I want to point you to these resources that we have on our website. Um, if you look at the first link, that is a webinar under our archived um, webinars, our library of webinars. It's a free webinar. And it's called Autism Guardianship, What You Need to Know. The second one um, is a link to access our 11-page uh, guardianship resource guide and developing an individual transition plan. And those are great resources found at our Transitioning to Adulthood page at the link that you will see um, on the slide. The third one is actually a link to a blog that explains to you more about supported decision-making, which is where um, an adult could have um, mentors around them to help them make decisions, um, financial decisions, or any other decisions that might need to be made. And there's um, a, a great blog that explains more about that and how to go about um, doing that for your child. And the last thing that I'll say about guardianship is that um, it is uh, something that you can start to really think about and actually start the process at age 17 and a half. So if you have a teenager right now that's approaching that age and you want to think about whether that's something that's um, needed, this would be a good time to check out those resources. So now for probably the rest of our um, time together, we're going to look at some of the um, tools that will help us with financial planning. As I said, one that's fairly new and maybe new to some of you on this uh, webinar is the NCABLE account, which is a tax advantage saving and investment account that allows eligible individuals with disabilities the opportunity to save money without jeopardizing eligibility for services and supports. As I mentioned earlier, um, these accounts can be a very important tool when you're trying to plan for an individual who's receiving SSI or other government benefits, and they are limited to that certain amount of assets. Remember the $2,000 uh, guideline that we talked about. So the official website for opening an NCABLE account is listed here, as well as a number that you can call or email if you have questions. Um, it's a relatively simple process, which can really be completed in about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and you do not have to have an attorney or a financial planner to do this. So a little bit more um, extra information about the ABLE accounts. Again, I already mentioned their tax advantage savings and investment accounts. 
um, they were created as a result of the passage of something called the Stephen Beck Jr. Achieving a Better Life Experience Act of 2014. That was federal legislation, better known as the ABLE Act. It was signed into law by President Obama. And I believe it was towards either end of 2014 or early 2015. Governor McCrory signed that into legislation in uh, North Carolina. And I believe we have ABLE accounts available now in about uh, 30, at least 30 some states here across the country. And North Carolina actually launched its program in January of 2017. And just as a little bit of information, um, the ABLE Act is considered by many to be one of the most significant pieces of legislation for the disability community since the ADA, the Americans for Disabilities Act, which became law in 1990. Some of you have probably heard of that. Um, but the law for ABLE was really a grassroots effort across the disability community. It originated with a group of parents of children with disabilities and they had really recognized that it just really was not fair for um, their children to be able to not save in their, you know, or for them to be able to save funds in their child's name for fear of losing their essential benefits, uh, benefits that allow their child to live independently in the community. So with an ABLE account, the individual with the disability is the ABLE account owner. And the account owner, their family, their friends, an employer, um, or the account owner's special needs trust may actually um, all contribute funds into an ABLE account. Um, ABLE account owners, both those who receive and those who do not receive public benefits, may save for and contribute to an ABLE account as long as they meet some specific requirements. Um, and you do not, I'll just say up front, you do not need to be currently receiving any type of SSI or other government benefits to be eligible. Basically, the ABLE um, accounts are modeled after 529 college accounts, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, and the contributions accumulate tax deferred and any earnings will be tax free as long as money is used for what is known as qualified disability expenses or QDEs. And the QDEs can include rent, housing, transportation, educational needs, employment, training and supports, assistive technology, healthcare and therapies, et cetera. Anything that's related to um, the expenses for that individual um, in regards to their disability. ABLE accounts, like I said, are relatively easy to set up online and can be done without assistance or need for an attorney or financial planner although they can certainly give you some advice on that if you you know have already met with one or are planning to they can certainly help you um, sort out whether that's an appropriate option um, account beneficiaries must meet criteria for eligibility the individual can be any age when the account is set up but the disability must have had onset before age 26. So again, the onset of the disability must have been before age 26. However, the individual can still be eligible if the official diagnosis came after that age. So if you, for instance, have a child or an adult who does not get an official autism diagnosis until they are 30, but that onset, they were, um, you know, we're looking at that before age 26, um, then they are still eligible for that. So in a nutshell, the, the beneficiary has to basically be eligible, even if they're not receiving benefits, they should be somebody who's entitled to SSI benefits or SSDI benefits or obtain a disability certification that meets the IRS rules or criteria. Um, the link at the bottom of this slide, park here for just a minute, it will link you right to the North Carolina Treasurer's Office page and they are the, um, you know, the, the gatekeepers for the ABLE accounts. Um, it goes through the North Carolina Treasurer's Office. And this link will take you to a 15 minute PowerPoint deck that will take you through. Um, you can go through those slides and get more information. Some that I've already shared with you about the, um, the eligibility requirements, but you can get even more information on an ABLE account there. Also, this next slide here, 
has a link to um, an ASNIC archived ABLE account webinar on YouTube. Um, and this is about a 45 minute webinar that will give you even more information on um, the ABLE account. And what I will say here, um, this one is a great resource. It goes pretty in depth. Um, this was done by a representative of the North Carolina Treasurer's Office. Um, there are some provisions, just so you'll know, if you happen to have already started a 529 account for your child with a disability, that can actually be rolled over into an ABLE account through 2025. So uh, that is discussed in link in this webinar, if that's something that would be of interest. And so this is a really good resource for you on that. A couple more slides with some information on ABLE that might be helpful. Again, the accounts can be opened by the individual with a disability or by a parent or guardian on their behalf. Uh, up to $15,000 per year can be saved without jeopardizing eligibility for benefits. And over a lifetime, that will be $100,000. So if they're receiving SSI, um, up to that first $100,000 um, will not jeopardize those benefits. Um, and there is a $450,000 cap for an individual who is not worried about keeping SSI benefits. If that's not a worry, they could save up to that much in an ABLE account lifetime. So again, the first $100,000 in the ABLE accounts would be exempted from the SSI $2,000 individual resource limit. And if you're wondering what would happen once the account goes over, um, if and when an ABLE account exceeds $100,000, the beneficiary's SSI cash benefit would be suspended until such time as the account falls back below $100,000. But it's important to note that while uh, the beneficiary's eligibility for SSI cash benefit is suspended, this does not affect their ability to receive or be eligible to receive their uh, Medicaid assistance. Additionally, one thing that you may want to find out about, and this is also discussed in the um, ASNIC archived webinar on ABLE accounts, um, upon the death of a beneficiary, the state in which the beneficiary lived may file a claim to all or a portion of the funds in an ABLE account that is equal to the amount that that state spent on the beneficiary through their state Medicaid program. And that's commonly known as something called the Medicaid recapture or payback provision. Um, and this claim would recoup Medicaid related expenses only from the time that that ABLE account was open. But that is something to be aware of. And again, you can get more information about it in the webinar. Basically, the accounts are managed with a flat minimal fee for, per year. Right now, I believe it's $45 if you opt to get an um, electronic statement. If you need a paper statement like you would a banking statement, it would be $60 um, per year. Um, there's no enrollment fee to start an account. And like I said, it's a relatively fast, easy process. Um, you basically can start it up with a $25 minimum startup balance and funds are managed through an online portal. There are investment options available if you want the money to grow. If someone's saving for long-term um, needs, then they can choose um, anything from an aggressive to a conservative options. And the money could grow over time, but it's not insured, so it is possible to lose money. Um, other factors to consider, um, they try to make it very easy for the beneficiary or the account owner to be able to um, access their money. They can contribute the account to the account through a check, electronic funds transfer, payroll deposit, recurring contributions, or something that's known as U-Gift, and I actually don't have that listed on the slide, but U-Gift um, information is available at the website. That's a great way for grandparents or other family members to be able to contribute very easily online to um, the ABLE account owner. Um, they can also withdraw or act, have access to their account by going online, by calling the NC Treasurer's office, by mailing in a paper form, um, they also, you know, they can make it much like a checking account where they have a debit card or checking um, option um, that's done through the Fifth Third Bank. 
And um, you might want to know that there are levels of authorizing agents to help the account owner. And I think there's like four levels where a parent can help if needed. Um, level one would be somebody just to be an extra pair of eyes up through level four where um, the uh, agent is authorized to actually withdraw and um, do everything that the account owner actually does as well. Um, one last important note on the Naval account is that um, proof of eligibility is not required to open account. They aren't gonna be asking for your healthcare information or uh, a lot of um, documents for you to share. However, you should maintain a re record of your diagnosis, your benefits verification letter, or other relevant documents in the event that you prove eligibility at a later date. Um, you know, the IRS can audit and you would want to show that you, you know, your eligibility. Um, and basically what they do is they require you to self-certify your eligibility annually. So again, very simple process that can be done online. So what we get a lot of times with questions from parents as far as ABLES and uh, ABLE counts and special needs trust, they will say, you know, does my child need both of these? And the answer is maybe. Um, again, that's one of those questions that might best be answered by someone, um, you know, a financial planner or attorney. But um, I will say that maybe is the answer here. Uh, both are great tools, but just as each individual with autism is unique, each family situation is unique, and an individual can certainly have both, and the ABLE account can actually be used in conjunction with a special needs trust. So the choice of which one or both is gonna depend on, again, beneficiary specific needs, the financial goals, the family scenario, all of that. Um, and then one disclaimer that you will see at the bottom is that you don't, again, I think I mentioned this, you don't need an attorney to start an ABLE account, but more than likely you will need an attorney to set up a special needs trust. So your next question may be, if I need legal assistance or I'm gonna need an attorney, if I'm interested in trust, then who can help me? Um, certified financial planners are available or attorneys um, who are versed in estate planning and special needs. And one thing we like to tell families is don't be afraid to interview possible attorneys or planners. Um, there are lots of uh, attorneys out there with estate planning but you uh, may want to ask what their expertise is um, in regards to special needs planning, for, especially for a person with autism. Um, what is the planning process you use to serve families? What educational background do you have and what continuing education have you attended recently? And then a lot of times it's great just to you know, ask for some references. Can you provide me with three families as a reference? Um, and then we want to say again, this is another one of those times where you're welcome to contact your autism resource specialist to get referrals for certified planners or attorneys who have served families in your area. Um, and this is the link. I, I mentioned this earlier that we would have this, but if you do not know who your autism resource specialist is, you'll go to this link um, under our website, talk with a specialist and put in your county. You can find out who, um, the folks are in your region who can help you with that. And again, if you read the very bottom of the slide, um, we do want to stress that autism resource specialists are not legal advocates in any way, and we cannot advise on legal matters, but we can direct you to legal resources in your area. So before we tackle the more complex special needs trust, um, let's talk a minute about a document that's a non-legal document that's called the letter of intent. Uh, the letter of intent can be very important um, for future caregivers and support team, and it basically allows you to communicate exactly what you and your child envision for their future. Um, the letter of intent includes pertinent information about your child's daily routines, their likes and dislikes, medical information, current level of services, their leisure activities, their family history, key community players, food, diet, medications, benefits received, education, employment, residential environment, behavior management, their religious preferences, 
final arrangements even. Basically everything and anything that is important and necessary to their present life and future needs. So it's really important to note that a letter of intent should be a living document and should be frequently updated because remember we said at the beginning, things are gonna change. And so we want to look at it probably about once a year or as needed as things change. A tip that I will go ahead and provide when you're doing end of life planning, um, don't forget to include decisions that you as a parent caregiver can initiate up front to make end of life decisions for not only yourself, but for your loved one. For example, you might need to include uh, your desires for your child's aging health care, uh, their final arrangements at the end of your letter of intent and include special provisions for their final arrangements um, in any trust or funds that you're starting. Uh, again, an attorney or a planner would be, be uh, better able to advise you on this, but just something to keep in mind. So a little bit more about that letter of intent. Um, there are templates that can be found online. There's no one template. This is a non-legal document. So uh, you may find uh, different um, templates online to help you with this. If you go into Google, put in letter of intent, lots of things will pop up. One um, helpful resource here in North Carolina is available through First and Families of North Carolina, and I've given you a link here. They actually have a letter of intent clinic. And so you can actually, um, I believe it's free, but you can sign up um, for the clinic and actually kind of go through and learn to write a letter of intent and make sure that yours is very thorough and includes all the important things. Um, and then you would wanna make sure that you make and keep several copies of this letter of intent and make sure that key individuals know where to find it. Um, a copy of this, um, again, would be placed with all of your relevant legal and personal documents regarding your child and their future. Um, and you may want to consider, you know, if you've got a safety deposit box, that's a great place to keep it. Or if not, a fireproof folder or box is helpful. I've also found that a lot of times attorneys or planners will um, keep one of those on, you know, on file with your other documents as well. And now let's talk a little bit about uh, the special needs trust. Um, this tool, similar to the ABLE account, would allow families to leave inheritance to their child with a disability without jeopardizing his or her eligibility for government benefits. They can be complex and they can vary greatly. And so again, I'm just going to give you some very basics on this and more than likely you're going to you're going to want to consult an attorney or a planner in order to set this up. Um, some sources of funding, just so you'll kind of be thinking about what may already be um, something that's an option for you and your family. Um, some sources of funding include life insurance, uh, your retirement account, your 401k or IRAs, um, just a basic savings account that can be rolled over, um, stocks and mutual funds or CDs, real property, inheritance from other family members or friends. Um, a few terms that you would want to probably be familiar with, um, and again, an attorney or planner would help more th about with this, but just to be aware of these, um, the grantor is the person with the assets who is creating or funding the trust. Beneficiary would be the individual or group of individuals for whom a trust is created. Um, there are what are known as revocable or irrevocable trust. A revocable trust is a trust whereby provisions can be altered or canceled dependent on the grantor's wishes up to a certain point, usually their death. The irrevocable trust um, that cannot be modified or, or changed after it's created, except under exceedingly rare circumstances. So irrevocable trust may offer some tax shelter benefits that some families um, might wanna look into and um, that revocable trust would not. But a lot of families will opt to set up a revocable trust because um, it can be set up using their retirement or other funds, but it can be changed as time goes by. So typically, um, like I said, the revocable trust can be changed up to the point that it's set into motion legally by the death of the grantor. So briefly, let's look at just um, 
the types of special needs trust in a nutshell. Um, the first party trust typically holds the assets of the person with special needs, such as an inheritance or accident benefits. Um, it's held directly in their name. A third party trust typically holds funds that the family wishes to use in order to assist their loved one with special needs. And then there's also what's known as a pool trust, which is an alternative to the first party special needs trust. Um, basically, this is where a charity or a corporate entity can set up um, a trust that allows the beneficiaries they're serving to pool their resources together for investment purposes while maintaining individual accounts for each beneficiary's needs. And what usually happens with that is when one of the beneficiary dies, the funds remaining would then go to reimburse the government, kind of like the Medicaid recapture that we talked about, and then go toward the organization that has managed the trust. So they would get the rest of that funding, um, the organization that has managed that pool trust. So more important things to keep in mind with the special needs trust, they're funded in various ways, again, either during your lifetime or upon your death. Um, one thing that we really want to stress here is it's very important that the child's special needs trust, not the child him or herself, is listed as the beneficiary of any inheritances, as this can disqualify them from government benefits. One of those key points that you might need to communicate to grandparents or other well-meaning family members who are wishing to remember your loved one with a disability in their wills or estate planning. So important that they understand that. Benefits can be jeopardized, again, that $2,000 that we talked about, um, if they leave large amounts of money without specifically designating it um, to the trust. So in other words, it needs to say they're leaving those funds to the trust of John Doe or, or Jane Doe um, or the ABLE account of Jane Doe or John Doe instead of directly leaving it to that person's name. So again, uh, just to, to reiterate how much in assets can a person have right now based on current SSI benefits, an applicant who's single cannot have more than $2,000 in assets in their name. So some other things to consider. Um, an individual can be the beneficiary of more than one special needs trust. This is a little bit different than an ABLE account. Each person well, you know, that has an ABLE account, they can have one ABLE account in one state. Um, but here with the special needs trust, an individual can actually have several. This is a typical scenario when a grandparent or other family member might want to provide for a child with special needs. So they can be the beneficiaries of several trusts at one time. Some other things to know, a trustee is the person whom you choose to be responsible to tend to the provisions you've set in your trust documents. Um, it can be a sibling, a family member, other trusted friend, or even a corporate organization or entity in some cases. Um, you can name a trust advisor when you're doing end of life planning, someone who can be named to help oversee and advise on the needs of the beneficiary. A typical scenario for that would be um, when you've designated a corporate trustee, an organization, but you want a close sibling or family member to be involved and to be able to oversee. Um, that can definitely be um, incorporated into your planning. And you can name successor trustees. Um, if you have uh, several siblings and um, you know that maybe things happen and you want to say that you would like to start with designating with this first sibling and if something happens then there would be a successor and on and on. Um, and again, that's not just for siblings, but whoever your family member or trusted friends or whoever you want to name at that point. So you may question how are special needs trust funds used? They can pay for expenses that parents might typically have covered beyond the necessities of life. Um, you know, in a nutshell, they can supplement um, items to improve the beneficiary's quality of life or basically anything that's not provided by the beneficiary's government benefits. And I've frequently heard uh, planners or attorneys refer to them as the parent's pocketbook. So they're kind of like, um, you know, funds that we can designate um, for our loved ones. And they can include um, 
funding for home and, and or vehicle repair, uh, vacations, technology, educational expenses, things like extras like phone bill, cable or internet services, additional therapies and leisure activities. So once you're ready to start planning and we've given you lots of basic information today, you might ask, what do I need to have? And so this slide um, hopefully will give you a checklist of some helpful documents that you would wanna have in place when you would uh, go to meet with an attorney or a financial planner. These are things that they're typically gonna ask for up front. Um, they will wanna know if you have an existing will, um, birth certificates of all the parties involved, life insurance policies, especially if you're going to want to use those for uh, funding a trust or any of that, marriage certificate, bank account statements, social security cards, retirement fund paperwork, you know, the copies of any recent tax returns from the last couple of years, investment paperwork, um, your driver's licenses, your guardianship papers if you have them, or power of attorney or healthcare proxy, um, or property titles um, that might be helpful. So this is kind of helpful checklist for you moving forward. So as you're beginning to plan for your child's future in addition to just financial needs, um, and we talked about these just a little bit, but I just wanna one, one more time go back over some of these, you may wanna consider yours and again, your child's dreams for everyday living needs as they're able to express that. These are some categories that you may wish to address. Um, if you're coming up with your own letter of intent, and that's certainly something you can do, but you would want to include information on their present daily lives, as well as what you may desire for the future or what you might anticipate their needs to be in the future. Um, doing this can provide some very helpful guidelines for future caregivers and takes the guesswork out of what's appropriate, especially your loved one, you know, wouldn't be able to voice this on uh, for him or herself. Um, these topics would be great to be included not only in your letter of intent, but in those discussions that you might have with family members or future caregivers. And, and again, I'll briefly go through these daily activities, the social piece, hobbies or extracurricular activities, you know, are there additional supports needed for respite? Um, medical expenses or additional therapies you might anticipate. Um, how does your loved one um, access transportation? And how might they uh, access transportation in the future? Um, vacation, holidays, or residential options. And I do want to park just for a moment on residential options. That's one of those topics that we could talk about for a long time but um, it's a very individualized topic. So one of the first questions I'll just throw out to ask ourselves is, will my child be able to live independently, semi-independently or with support? Um, there's a wealth of information on our website. Um, and again, our needs are gonna vary um, depending on our situations, but it's certainly appropriate to include uh, what you are thinking in your um, letter of intent, your thoughts about where your child may wish to live or with who if you were not in the picture, um, or what would be an appropriate option. So these resources will help you as you're thinking about this. We have a residential options toolkit for more information about the options available, whether it's independent living options and the how to fund those to group living settings. So that's in a toolkit um, with the first link. And then our second link listed on this slide has online uh, webinar, residential options for adults with autism, that you can listen to a recorded webinar um, discussing those options that might be available. So I definitely would you know, encourage you to check those out at some point. So once you've made your letter of intent, your will, and you may have set up an ABLE account or trust or other financial tools, your next question may be, am I finished? And that's, that's a lot, but remember, things do change. So again, I think I mentioned it earlier, but we wanna revisit that letter of intent in any of these other documents um, frequently as needed. Um, your child's birth date's a good reminder. You know, has anything changed since last year? Are there any key players that have moved or have passed away or any of those things? Or has anything changed with our situation? Um, and remember, um, 
once you have that vision, it's really important not to just keep it to yourself um, or to tuck it away somewhere as, as easy as that might be. Sometimes we don't like to think about these things, but we do need to communicate with and prepare key support team members. So an important question, have you shared your vision once you've got it down and got everything in place? Have you shared it with other family members or friends who are gonna you know, be those people who step into that role for your child of being a caregiver or support person? Do they know where the important documents are? Um, and again, I mentioned early on, this, this can be a hard discussion to have, but have you asked your other children if you have other children or other family members who might be involved? How do they feel about the responsibilities of guardianship, a trustee or caregiver or advocate or any other future role they might have? Um, you know, sometimes you know, we just assume that people are going to step into certain roles without, you know, really coming out and asking them how they feel. So, you know, a lot of times as autism resource specialists, we will say to parents, what's your plan B? Um, remember, people's circumstances change. So be thinking about that and keeping that in mind. And then hopefully, when, you know, with the letter of intent and everything that we've planned and written down in our vision, you know, future caregivers are hopefully going to know the important people providers and the places and activities in um, our loved one's world. Um, you know, and for some, especially, we don't always think about it, but if a sibling who might be stepping up as a future caregiver has moved to California um, and is not here in North Carolina to really know everything that's going on, it's important that we're, you know, uh, relating that, writing it down, things that are important so that um, they would not, again, have to scramble if they were to have to step up to the plate and take over with offering support. So we're getting down towards the end of our presentation, but um, the next slides, I wanna talk about something that's kind of uh, probably one of the most difficult things for us to think about, and that's how and if we should prepare our child. Um, for the eventuality that we will not be here. And that's gonna, again, be a very individual process for each of us, but just wanna give you some food for thought. Um, one of our um, favorite folks on the autism spectrum, Temple Grandin has given us a nice quote here. Unfortunately, most people never observe the natural cycle of birth and death. Um, so, you know, we hopefully are gonna be able to, if we're addressing this topic, um, you know, talk about the natural cycle of birth and death. Um, we know that most of in individuals with autism want to know what's coming next, how long it's going to last, and when it's going to be over. So again, that said, each of us is different. Social narratives and dialogues may help a lot with our individuals. Um, planning ahead and keeping routines similar will most likely be a great help as well. Um, and I want to take a minute to talk just about a brand new resource that we have on our website that was created by um, some of our clinical team. Um, they've done a lot of great uh, narratives for us over the past few months with the pandemic, but one just went live yesterday under social narratives, and you'll see the link here. And it is a link to some narratives on death, actually gives some, and loss, so it actually goes a little bit even beyond, but you know, talking about loss or grief and how to handle that with our individual on the spectrum. Um, and they give some great samples of um, social stories written how to explain um, to a person about death or the loss of a loved one. So please check those out. Um, there's also a great blog that's gonna go live on this very, very topic. So I won't go into it in great detail, but I will say, please check this out if it's of interest to you. Um, it just went live yesterday. So some just some basics I do want to talk about that everyone um, deals with grief and loss in their lifetime, and this certainly includes individuals with autism, um, and they may need some extra support. Um, for those on the spectrum, there may be a mixture of cognitive, behavioral, and emotional reactions when they are trying to express grief over a loss. Their timetable for grief may look very different and may be extended. Uh, they may react with anxiety or fear whenever loss or death is discussed. And again, this is going to be very individual. Some of us are going to decide that, you know, this is not something we're going to be able to do a lot with up front. 
um, until the time comes where we would have to, you know, deal with that because it might cause a lot of anxiety. Um, but then other individuals are going to want to talk about grief and we can use everyday, um, you know, processes and life cycle to talk about these things. Um, or individuals, you know, may have difficulty expressing their feelings and react very differently than expected. For example, an individual might end up laughing while others are tearful. So again, I just you know, want to remind you that every individual is unique and family members may want to think about and plan how much information is discussed and when according to their loved one's age, their communication skills, and their level of understanding or their ability to process information. Some possible coping strategies that you may see from an individual on the spectrum just in dealing with grief or loss um, that are different, maybe from neurotypicals. They may favor solitude over sharing of emotions or receiving comfort from someone else. So a lot of times we know that typically um, we lose someone in our family. Um, we want to be around other family members. We want to gain support or share emotions or receive comfort. And this is not always the case with someone on the spectrum. Um, sometimes they are focusing on their special interests or their familiar routines because that's their way of coping um, with something that's, that's different or new to them. Sometimes they react by being extremely logical or focusing on a problem solving rather than sharing feelings. And I think it brings us to an important tip that we just need to make sure that we don't equate lack of emotion or a different type of emotion or a delayed reaction with a lack of empathy. Remember that reaction may be very different than what's expected or it can be very delayed. Um, you know, and that can be a little bit offsetting, um, you know, for a family member who's stepping up and seeing that, you know, uh, John is worried about, you know, what he's going to do for bowling on Monday night when, you know, John was used to going bowling with his dad or his brother that he's lost on Monday night. So um, that might seem an unusual reaction, um, but that's something in his mind, you know, that he's trying to focus on problem solving rather than really being able to share the feelings about what's going on or what he feels like inside. Some extra strategies for support um, that we might want to think about. Um, listening, observing, affirming feelings, reassuring, and being patient. Those are like the key, key words here. Um, we don't want to avoid talking, but explaining fully as we can um, and providing opportunities to talk more as needed. Just whenever we're thinking about broaching the topic of death or loss with an, a loved one with autism, we want to keep our discussions consistent with their developmental level. Um, sometimes comfort is just through giving basic, concrete information and keeping their daily routines the same as possible. Um, and one tip here, remember individuals with autism may have difficulty with abstract concepts. So uh, we want to remember that language can be interpreted quite literally. So we want to avoid uh, ambiguous phrases such as going to sleep or passed away or we have lost Uncle Joe or whatever. These may need to be avoided because they may not understand, uh, you know, that uh, literally or take be able to understand that. Some more strategies, just giving concrete examples of death and what it means. Again, um, taking uh, advantage of those um, everyday moments that we can, for instance, with the death of a pet or um, something in, in, in the environment, comparing a live pet such as a fish to a deceased one, using daily examples um, to explain death as part of the natural life cycle. You know, everyone is born, everyone dies at some point. Um, and sometimes just, you know, for some individuals, teaching before the loss occurs can be helpful. Again, that's a very individual thing. Um, some of you may want to consider uh, having your loved one view videos or um, look at books about when someone dies, and that can help make the concept more concrete, especially if you know that there is an impending um, death to come in the family. Sometimes, you know, preparing that individual by, um, you know, getting more information from a video or book can be very helpful. Also, just providing opportunities for participation um, in bereavement activities, if you're going to do that, 
um, you would want to be sure to prepare ahead with social narratives, which explain the events that are going to happen, say at a funeral or some type of, um, you know, wake or whatever, um, and give the expectations, what's expected, um, like basically a social story on what might happen at a funeral. Um, just some possible activities to think about, and again, the blog that's gone live um, from our clinical team on loss and support will be very helpful and go more in depth on this, but just some things to consider um, when you're helping an individual on the spectrum cope or um, process death. You know, they may want to create a memory box of objects that would bring happy memories, or creating a photo album or a scrapbook or maybe doing that favorite activity together with someone new that they used to do with their loved one, you know, finding a way to keep that routine, um, you know, alive for them. Sometimes just writing letters or journaling or drawing pictures can be really helpful. Remember that, you know, that process of loss or grief can be, um, you know, different and it also can be very extended for them. And just some ideas for parents or caregivers. Um, just briefly, you may want to write a letter or make a video containing thoughts or messages that you want to leave behind for your loved one. Um, and you can consider maybe placing a significant object or trinket that the person associates with you, along with your photos in a special box for that one that you leave behind. And these ideas were actually taken from a book um, that I found to be very helpful. Um, it was called Taking, uh, excuse me, Understanding Death and Illness and What They Teach About Life by Catherine Faherty, who's um, a professional who's worked with the Teach Center. She lives in the western part of the state, but has has done a really um, that might be very helpful. And that's what which we're actually taken from. So let's remember, um, I know this was a, a very heavy topic to discuss today for probably all of us, um, but our kids need a um, little help, a little hope and someone who believes in them. And I think that future planning by those of us who really are the main believers in our loved ones will be helpful. And hopefully it will be a priceless gift to not only them to, but ourselves as caregivers in the process. Before we wind down, I just briefly will kind of go through these resource slides with you. Again, you're going to get access to these um, links, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the minute, but I just want to briefly go through here. Um, there's some toolkits and webinars on our page. All of these are linked, um, and you'll get the links here. Um, that last link on this slide is to the ASNIC ABLE webinar that I mentioned. Um, some resources from other agencies, Disability Rights, Life Plan Trust, the North Carolina Council on Developmental Disabilities, and an agency, fivewishes.org, which can help you with um, end-of-life planning. So other, uh, other resources and blog articles. More of the same, these about financial issues. The MetLife Company has some great resources um, on the financial end for families some articles to read, more on the Letter of Intent Clinic and the Lifetime Connections Workshop for Future Planning, which would be a good resource um, through our First and Families of North Carolina. Also, this third link is a sibling resource guide. So this may be something to make sure that you've tucked away if you have some future caregivers who are siblings that would give them a comprehensive list of national and North Carolina resources for um, you know, people with disabilities, something to have for them. And also to keep in mind, um, the ARC has some great um, resources for uh, future planning that you can access and have a link for that. These next couple slides are uh, the slides that I told you about have the potential resources for low or no cost legal services. So, um, you know, we have, First in Families has some financial assistance to families in different, um, uh, needing different types of assistance um, financially. Legal Aid of North Carolina. Um, again, we talked about pro bono attorneys. When something is out, out of their scope, they can make some referrals for that. Um, so these are just some ideas. I'm kind of scrolling through. Law Help 
North Carolina, the North Carolina Bar Association. Um, some of our law schools have pro bono clinics. Um, there's a monthly or annual fee for membership, but they may be more affordable. So um, that's something to check out. But more on um, getting some um, uh, lower cost legal services. There are some legal aid self-help clinics and legal zoom can give you some um, tips on doing you know some of this work yourself so it does save on financial uh, fees for these um, services again i know i'm scrolling so uh, you will get access to these links um, these are some just more resources on supporting through the death and grieving process i know i mentioned our uh, brand new link on our website um, under the social narratives. And then these are some more articles um, using Carol Gray Social Stories, the second link. There's an article about, um, you know, doing social narratives and doing your own if you like to write your own. Um, and then a couple of books. I mentioned the Catherine Faraday book. And then there's also a book that's written by um, a self-advocate, Deborah Lipsky, um, How People with Autism Grieve and How to Help, which I found to be an, a helpful book. So we just know that there's two gifts we can give our children and one is roots and the other is wings. And again, um, we've kind of come to the close of um, the main part of the presentation.